Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's very good to have you with us tonight. To all our specially invited guests, my name is Roger Marshall, and I serve as Executive Director of Project Probe Ministries. For those of you who are not aware, Project Probe Ministries is a local, non-denominational Christian apologetics organization, which has been operating in Barbados for the past um, uh, 14 years. We facilitate lectures and discussions on important issues of controversy to the Christian faith, which at the same time caters to the interests of the general public. Tonight, under the theme, Back to the Beginning, we revisit the subject of evolution versus creation with our specially invited guest speaker, retired associate professor of physics, Dr. Russell Humphreys. Best-selling author John MacArthur in his book, The Battle for the Beginning, forthrightly said, and I quote, thanks to the theory of evolution, naturalism is now the dominant religion of modern day society, modern society. Less than a century and a half ago, Charles Darwin popularized the credo for the secular religion. Naturalism has now replaced Christianity as the main religion of the Western world, and evolution has become its principal dogma." Unquote. A key and very important component in evolutionary theory is the age of the earth and the universe. While biblical chronology, believed by many to be a myth, implies the world is only a few thousand years old, evolutionary theory, believed by many to be a fact, teaches that the world is billions of years old. Actually, evolution needs that amount of time for the supposed evolutionary chance processes to work. If the world is young, there is absolutely no time for evolution to occur not to mention the many other insurmountable problems against the theory. Over an eight-year period, Dr. Humphreys and a team of seven other young Earth creation scientists from several scientific disciplines conducted a research project dubbed Radioisotopes and the Age of the Earth, or simply the RATE project. The findings of the research project have brought into serious question the long evolutionary ages of Earth history taught as fact to the public while corroborating the biblical time scale which the public is taught to disbelieve by the advocates of evolution in academia and the media. The research was reported at the fall 2003 meeting of the American Geophysical Union in San Francisco, California. Tonight, Dr. Humphreys will speak to some of these findings and other evidences for a young world in his first lecture, Scientific Evidence for a Young World after which he will address your questions. We now call on medical practitioner, Dr. Elvis Wickham, to formally introduce Dr. Humphreys. Dr. Humphreys was raised in a scientifically aware but non-Christian home. He was raised an atheist. He only became a Christian at around age 27, but it was not until about a year later that he became a creationist. Main reason being that there was no explanation for the billions of years it was believed the Earth to have existed um, up until now. But while doing his graduate studies uh, and research in that area, a uh, credible theory uh, did come across a credible theory and research which backs up said theory and subsequently became a, a creationist. He did his undergraduate studies at Duke University uh, where he obtained a BS bachelor's degree in physics, moved to Louisiana, where in Louisiana State University he pursued postgraduate studies in physics and received his uh, PhD in physics on cosmic rays and ultra high energy nucleon interactions in, in 1972, by which time he was a fully convinced creationist due to both biblical and scientific evidence. For the next seven years he worked for the General Electric Company, designing and inventing equipment, researching high voltage phenomena. He subsequently worked for a national laboratory in nuclear physics, geophysics, 
Pulse Powered Research, and this was in New Mexico, and there he worked for 22 years. He has also been involved with a number of uh, creation societies. He has been a graduate school professor in physics. He retired fully in the year 2008, but continues to do uh, creation research, writing and speaking, mostly on his own, but for creation societies. As I said, if I were to actually go through the number of articles that he has written, we would be spending the rest of the night listening to me, but that is not our point here. It is indeed my great pleasure, because I personally am excited to hear this research, to introduce to you tonight Dr. Russell Humphreys. works. Uh, thank you for inviting me to your beautiful island. I'm, I'm really enjoying my stay here already. Uh, I have only been to the Caribbean once before to Nassau, uh, and I've never been this far south in, uh, in this ocean you're surrounded with. So I really appreciate the chance uh, to just be here. Now, uh, I do want to give you evidence that the world is rather young. Uh, and one reason is that a young world makes sense of both scripture and science. And by young, I mean it's thousands of years and not millions of years old. I didn't believe this to begin with, uh, raised as an atheist in a science-minded family and uh, through most of my college years. And only after I accepted Christ as my Savior in 1969 uh, did the Lord start mopping up my mind. Uh, but mainly, uh, about a year after that, I received some information, a book by Dr. Henry Morris. Some of you, some of you may know him. Uh, and uh, that suddenly made me realize that all the time I'd been raised, Nobody had actually given me any solid scientific evidence for billions of years or for evolution. Everyone had just assumed it was true, and so it was in the air. It was sort of like assuming the sky is blue, okay? They, nobody questioned it. Uh, no, one, no one thought that uh, it should be proven. Uh, so. That's the way most scientists are, by the way. Uh, they have not investigated most of the evidence that I'm going to be presenting to you tonight, even though much of it, I'd say most of it, is in the scientific literature. It's just not labeled as being evidence uh, that the world is only thousands of years old and not millions. So just one quick look at the Bible, and then we'll get into the science. But uh, this is my favorite of about 14 passages throughout the whole scriptures, including uh, the New Testament, for example. Uh, thank you. Uh, could you hear me before? <laughs> I'm Dr. Russell Humphreys. <laughs> uh, the fourth commandment. People are surprised that uh, evidence in scripture for a young world is outside Genesis chapter 1. So... Uh, but here is Exodus. It's in the middle of the Ten Commandments. And uh, God said uh, to Israel, six days you shall work, and on the seventh day you shall rest. Four. And the audio is a little enthusiastic here. Uh, four and six days, and he used the same Hebrew word. Uh, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. So here's the Hebrew. I'm not an expert in Hebrew, but I know enough to say that I don't know much in Hebrew. So uh, uh, that's the word sheshit, meaning six, and that's yamim, which is the plural of days. And he, it's the same all the way through the passage. So he says, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and that's the Hebrew way of saying the whole universe. So... Uh, 
he made everything in just six days. And the context of this verse is ordinary days of the week. Because he goes on to say, uh, uh, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. On the seventh he rested. Therefore you Israelites, Moses was saying to them, uh, you shall keep the Sabbath day holy. And so he was talking about a day of the week. So this is a very powerful verse to me. So because the Bible is so strong uh, about uh, the age of the world, and this is only one of 14 major passages, uh, because it's so strong on this, uh, it's important to kind of nail it down in your mind. Uh, so one thing to look at is what he didn't say. And so he didn't use uh, this phrase, uh, this word, olam, uh, means long time or age, and in, other, in the Greek it's translated as ion, which we translate as eon. He didn't say for in six eons he made the heavens and the earth. And he uh, didn't say uh, la elef dor to the thousandth generation. That would be about 20,000 years if a generation is 20 years. He didn't use that little phrase, which is often used. He didn't use this phrase here. Uh, uh, let's see, elephi revavot shanim. Uh, elephi revavot means thousands of tens of thousands. So at least 10 million, perhaps up to 100 million. Uh, and that, those first two words are used elsewhere in Genesis uh, by, let's see, it was, uh, Rebecca's sisters who uh, wished that she would have that many children or grandchildren. And, uh, but it's not used in connection with days so, uh, or years. So uh, he didn't say any of those things. So that's almost as significant to me uh, as uh, what he did say. Because he could have just said, you work six days for in six long ages I made the, the universe. You see what I'm saying? It's sort of you know, if God is not trying to fool us, uh, he's saying it didn't take him long to make the whole universe. Now, uh, there's one other passage in scripture which is pretty powerful to uh, believers, and this is, next is my favorite New Testament evidence. Uh, Jesus Christ implies that the world is young. Uh, in the famous passage in Mark 10, and also it's in... Uh, in Matthew, and I believe it's elsewhere too, uh, he's talking about marriage and divorce. And he starts his discourse by saying, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female, Mark 10, 6. So beginning, that's the first verse of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the first beginning of the first day. Uh, and then God made them male and female as a quote from the sixth day of creation. So Jesus is calling all of that the beginning, uh, and he's saying mankind has been around from the very beginning. Now, that's not what evolution says. Uh, the Big Bang Theory says. The Big Bang says uh, in the beginning there was a big kaboom, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and that was about four or five, of, I'm sorry, 15, 14. Why is it doing that? <laughs> Keep an eye on it. You know, threaten it a little bit. So, uh, maybe Satan doesn't want you to hear the next thing I was going to say. Uh, so the Big Bang is supposed to be about 14 billion years ago, according to the current numbers. And then about 5 billion years ago, the solar system came into existence, and the Earth a little after that, according to the Big Bang. And mankind, in his present form, uh, they think, did not come along until about 200,000 years ago, which is a tiny fraction of 14 billion years. So the evolutionists would not say what Jesus said uh, from the beginning of the creation or from the beginning of the universe, God made them male and female. So there's a big difference. Uh, so uh, there's a close-up look at the sixth day. 
There's no room for long ages. This is off. Okay. All right. Good. So uh, Jesus Christ implies that the world is young. So uh, the idea that the world is old started about 400 years ago with the Enlightenment philosophers. Uh, the, uh, they, they were the first to make it you know, acceptable, academically acceptable, to be skeptical about the Bible in print and openly. And uh, the first um, among these uh, was Baruch Spinoza, and he made it fashionable to attack scripture in academic circles. And part of the attack was on the scriptural time scale, and everything else that scripture said. Uh, there's a picture of his little uh, theological tract, theological uh, political tract. So he used science uh, to discredit the biblical time scale. I don't know why the volume is coming and going. That's, uh, I think there's a, a gremlin in the audio system. So pray about the audio system, please. <laughs> so uh, let's bring some scientific data into this discussion now. This was a huge shock to me as a beginning uh, creationist, as I started to encounter evidence uh, that most of the ways you could date the world give you a young world. And there are probably several hundred ways one could date the world. Uh, and 90% of those, at first sight, give you a young world, not millions of years old, but much younger. And only 10% of those methods, at first sight, give you uh, millions or billions of years. Now, you've unfortunately only heard about the 10%. Those are the ones that get publicized. But what I want to do is go through a sample of the 90% for you, and then, uh, and then give uh, the, some of the, what we found out about the 10% also. So here's some documentation. And you've got this. You should have this. If you uh, don't have this, you can get some right now. And I'm going to be going through this little brochure, Evidence for a Young World, uh, through many of the evidences. There's 14 of them in here. And uh, so if you don't, do you all have copies? Does anyone not have a copy? OK, good. Hang on to it. Uh, this is a good one uh, to have references for. It's got, it's got the references where you can look up on uh, in books, uh, scientific journals, and the internet, uh, these items to check out what I am saying. So the, you can get this uh, more copies at icr.org. Uh, they have a journal, little mag, uh, little a little thing this size uh, that comes out every month called ICR Impact, and they have an archive. And as uh, you can see on here, this is the June 2005 issue. This one uh, became very popular and, uh, and uh, in the first year or so, uh, they, uh, people asked for about 50,000 copies. So it's, uh, it's useful to people. Now, uh, pamphlet item number one, galaxies wind themselves up too fast. Now, a galaxy is an island of about 100 billion stars. And that's a typical galaxy, a lot like our own. This is the nearest neighbor galaxy called Andromeda. Uh, and galaxies are about 100,000 light years across. Uh, and a light year is how far light travels in a year. And I think, uh, I think it's uh, six. Six trillion kilometers. So uh, I might be wrong. Maybe that's six billion kilometers. It's a big distance. And our own galaxy is that size. So that's what a galaxy is. And, and you notice uh, this is a typical spiral galaxy. See those, these arms uh, sort of form a swirling whirlpool spiral pattern? 
uh, they can measure how fast the stars whirl in the galaxy. This one, this galaxy is actually, the stars are going this way. And the inner stars in a galaxy whirl very fast. But the outer ones, according to the laws of gravity, uh, whirl slowly, and uh, they're measured to whirl slowly. So uh, what happens as the time goes on, the galaxy stars tend to drag behind on the outer part, and the galaxy sort of just winds itself up into a smooth disk of stars, uh, sort of like winding up a clock spring. And uh, it, it used to be called the winding up dilemma by uh, many astronomers. And over the years, and it's, I think it's been around 80 years, uh, they have devised various theories to try to explain how these stars could still be in this form after billions of years. Because you see, uh, our galaxy and this one are supposed to be 10 billion years old. And yet, to get to this state, if you started with a solid bar, or not a solid, but a bar of stars, uh, that was rotating, it would take you less than three-tenths of a billion years to get to this state. So, so if it's 10 billion years old, it should just be a nice smooth disk of stars. So there's various theories, uh, but none of them have worked very well, and uh, the, the current one has been around for a while with no replacement, but it uh, has run into serious problems uh, with the astronomical data. So tomorrow's uh, show, uh, the talk that I will give tomorrow night, uh, shows how the light from Andromeda could get to us uh, across six million light years worth of distance uh, very early on the fourth day of creation, very quickly. So that's, uh, hope you'll be able to come tomorrow. Uh, pamphlet item number two. There's not enough star explosion smoke, I call it. Uh, the official name is supernova remnants. There's, uh, here's an example of one, the Crab Nebula. Uh, that's uh, dust and gas from a star that exploded. And uh, you can see uh, these supernova remnants. Uh, uh, for they should last about a million years, one million years. So astronomers figure uh, that we should see about, at the rate that supernovas happen, we should see about 3,000 uh, in our part of our galaxy. Uh, and uh, the question is, do we see that much? And the answer is no. Uh, we only see about 200. So that implies, uh, you know, uh, very roughly 7,000 to 14,000 years worth, and those numbers change a little. Uh, so uh, it's not the million years worth uh, that we should be seeing. So there's something wrong. So maybe things are younger out there. So the next uh, brochure item is closer to home. It's in our own solar system. So finished with this one. Oh, I forgot to mention, yes, there's an update. Uh, last year, uh, Creation Research Society Conference in 2014, a fellow named Keith Davies, uh, an astronomer, uh, has uh, pointed out that uh, the same thing is true for our nearest neighbor in the southern hemisphere, small dwarf galaxies called the Magellanic Clouds. Uh, they should be able to see those supernova remnants uh, in the Magellanic clouds, and they don't see nearly as much. They see only thousands of years, not a million years worth. So now the next item is uh, in our own solar system. So this is pamphlet item number three. Uh, comets crumble too quickly. Uh, the astronomer Fred Whipple said that comets are dirty snowballs uh, and uh, when those dirty snowballs approach the sun, uh, the solar wind and light uh, blow back uh, ice. Uh, they, they blow back water vapor and other gases and dust uh, from the comet as it approaches the sun. 
and also it's, it goes away. Uh, and this material never comes back, or most of it doesn't come back to the comet when it swings back out into the outer solar system. It loses material every pass around the sun. About 5% of its material each pass. So depending on how fast they come back, and some of them come back uh, fairly often, uh, they should be fairly young. So they're supposed to be remnants of, of the ice, chunks of ice uh, that were here five billion years ago when the solar system allegedly started. And uh, their lifetime in the solar system, for many of them, the ones that come back fairly fast, uh, 10,000 years. At most, maybe 90 to 100,000 years. Uh, Halley's Comet uh, has an astronomical age uh, in the solar system of about 90,000 years. So that's a lot less than 5 billion years, you see. Now, there is a theory. Uh, it's called the Oort cloud theory, where these dirty snowballs are way out, you know, uh, you know, maybe a tenth of the way out to the nearest star, really way out there. And uh, it's a spherical cloud. And uh, every now and then, there's an interaction or a collision or something that makes one of these snowballs come, come into the Earth, uh, toward the Earth, or toward the solar system. And then it suffers another interaction with a planet and settles down into a, a smaller orbit. The only problem is they've never been able to make that theory work. And uh, later, uh, there's been an intermediate, uh, not cloud, but belt, called the Kuiper Belt, of very large chunks of ice out there in, at the orbit of Neptune and Pluto. But the Kuiper Belt uh, cannot explain the comets either. Uh, there's not enough things in it. So uh, it looks like the simple answer is that uh, the solar system is less than 10,000 years old. Now this is pamphlet item number four. See, some of these things are not all that hard to understand. You've been buffaloed. Uh, many of you have been frightened of science uh, ever since uh, uh, that really boring teacher in grade school and who was pushing evolution besides. And so uh, you ran away from science ever since. But really, science at the root of it is just kind of simple stuff, OK? And it, I think ever since I was a kid, I've thought it's fun. So uh, this is another simple item. Uh, Seafloor mud accumulates too fast. So here's a cross section of the continents and the ocean. And uh, I'll talk about the plate subduction in a moment. Uh, rivers carry mud with them, as you know. And they enter the ocean. And geoscientists have added up uh, how much mud uh, there enters. These are not creationist geoscientists, but secular. Uh, uh, and 20 billion tons of mud per year. And uh, if you spread that mud all over the whole ocean from the continental edges uh, uniformly, uh, the mud would be about 400 meters thick. OK, so that gives you an idea of how much mud is there. Now, uh, there is a way that that mud can get out of the ocean, and that's by this plate tectonic subduction. So uh, subduction is just Latin for leading under. Uh, these plates, these big plates all over the Earth, are moving very slowly at centimeters per year. That's as, as fast as your fingernail grows. And uh, if it could carry all of the 400 meters out with it, you know, just sort of drag the mud out with it, then that would get rid of about 1 billion, maybe 2 billion, tons per year. The other 18 or 19 billion tons simply would accumulate year after year. You with me? And if it accumulates at that rate for as long as the ocean is supposed to have been around, 3 billion years, you would have dozens of kilometers of mud there. So there's a little problem. So uh, the maximum age you get at today's rate of entry uh, of mud uh, would be about 12 million years, which is long to you, but to a geoscientist, that's peanuts. 
It's a lot less than the three billionaires. So, uh, and the rate would have been a lot higher during one major event in Earth's history called the Genesis Flood. Uh, the Genesis Flood could have eroded most of the mud uh, in one year, about, about 5,000 years ago, uh, and dumped all of what we see, uh, pretty much all of what we see, uh, just during that major catastrophe. See, so all of these things uh, is our maximum. This is a maximum possible age, assuming a constant rate of deposit. But in actual fact, the rate hasn't been constant. And we know of the Genesis Flood and have lots of evidence for it. Uh, that would shorten that age to 5,000 years. Pamphlet item uh, number five, uh, the sea is not salty enough. So uh, those same rivers that carry mud in, uh, into the ocean also carry dissolved salt and sodium and chlorine and other uh, materials from those rocks that uh, get weathered. And uh, so geoscientists have measured how much goes in. Uh, the sodium that goes in is about 450 million tons per year. So that's the input, and geoscientists have known what I'm going to talk about is a problem, and they've known that since the 1930s. Uh, so they have sought for ways to get sodium out of the ocean, uh, and all they've been able to come up with is uh, about 120 million tons per year. So the rest of, of this, uh, that would be 330 million tons, would accumulate year after year. So over two-thirds of the sodium that goes in stays in. So uh, Dr. Steve Austin and I did a technical paper on this. Uh, for those of you who are uh, uh, into the creationist literature, there's an uh, international conference on creationism that we uh, uh, wrote this up, and there's also a website, I don't know if that's in this art here or not, uh, where you can see an archived version. But the bottom line of this is that the maximum age, uh, assuming the slowest possible inputs according to evolutionists, and the fastest possible outputs according to evolutionists, and assuming no, no salt in the ocean to start with, the maximum age would be 62 million years. But again, the Genesis flood could account for all of the sodium that's in the ocean now. It, uh, the seas may have been fresh water uh, before the flood. So the Genesis flood would make that 62 million years much younger, uh, would make it about 5,000 years also. Pamphlet item number six, the Earth's magnetic field is losing energy too fast. Now, don't confuse magnetic field with gravitational field. Gravitational field keeps you in a chair, and uh, magnetic field makes compass needles point north. So uh, I had to explain that to a technician who is well-trained in science at Sandia National Laboratories once. <laughs> he, I, we work with magnetic fields, but somehow he got gravitational fields and magnetic fields confused. And so, anyhow, um, so what causes the magnetic field of planets is a large electric current in their conducting cores. The Earth has a core which is most, mostly molten iron, uh, and that's a good electrical conductor. And the current that's circulating in it, according to both evolutionist views and creationist views, that current uh, amounts to about six billion amperes. But electric currents uh, have to run through real conductors. This is not a superconductor in there. This is, this is a metal, molten metal with electrical resistance, and that wears down this current. So you could think of it like a, a flywheel or a spinning bicycle wheel the electrons are uh, represented by the wheel spinning, and friction slows down the spinning wheel. Okay, if you took your bicycle and uh, 
put it upside down and, and just spun the, the front wheel, uh, friction would slow that wheel down. Well, the friction is also slowing down those electrons in the Earth's core. And we can measure how fast it's losing its energy. The field has a, a certain amount of energy, or you could think of it as the energy that uh, you could extract from the electrical current. But you can measure the strength of the field as it gets weaker and weaker year by year. And we have done that. And so at the rate that it's losing energy now, it loses about half its energy every 1,400 years. Now, so if you go back in time 1,400 years, it would be uh, twice as strong as now. Another 1,400 years, twice as strong as that, or four times stronger than now. And you can't go very far back before you get to levels of current that are just unreasonable. They, they would melt, start melting large parts of the Earth uh, if you go back millions of years. So that limits, uh, unless there's some way that uh, the Earth can make that current, uh, restore that current, and keep it going. So the other side has a theory called the, the dynamo theory. And they've been trying for nearly 100 years to make one or another dynamo theory. Dynamo is your word, or the English, the English English uh, word for electrical generator, which is the American way of saying it. But somehow they, they're hoping that motions of that fluid within the core will somehow maintain or make up for those electrical losses. And I uh, did a review paper of this a few years ago for a creationist uh, conference. And uh, it looks like they still haven't found it. They've just got sort of like hand-waving theories, OK, but they don't really work. Uh, and they've been trying for 100 years. So in the absence of some way to maintain that current, it means the current couldn't have been going on very long, and certainly not a million years. Uh, the maximum age you get if you extrapolate back uh, just smoothly uh, uh, to, to some uh, reasonable level uh, is about 20,000 years. However, uh, we have evidence that the Earth's magnetic field reversed its direction about once every day for during the year uh, all the fossil layers were being laid down uh, during the year of Noah's flood creationists think. And uh, the other side doesn't have a theory for uh, how those reversals would happen, since they can't make a regular dynamo theory work anyhow. So, But we do have a theory. And that says that each reversal would chew up some energy. So, uh, so it would lose energy faster than it is losing energy today during the Genesis flood. And the, uh, the age could be as low as 6,000 years. Now, a new e-book uh, has much more. Earth's mysterious magnetism and that of other celestial orbs, like the other planets in the solar system, uh, several moons, our own moon, uh, asteroids, uh, meteorites, uh, stars, the sun. The magnet there's magnetic fields, large magnetic fields in all those bodies, or there were, and there's evidence that they were, had, did have strong fields. And it's by me and uh, a good uh, engineer, co-author, who's a very good uh, writer. And he took about 30 years worth of technical papers on these subjects by me and uh, digested them down to something that's very readable uh, and has no equations in it at all. So. Uh, so it, uh, it's actually, I think, a very good contribution. So that's going to be available at the Creation Research Society website, their bookstore, creationresearch.org. And it may be also soon available at other creation websites, like creation.com and others. So. Pamphlet item number eight. Now, this is something that's been happening over the last decade or so. Uh, a new item, and I can just give you a little sample of what's going on. Uh, it's very exciting, uh, and it has made a lot of uh, biologists uh, buy into the idea of a young world. Uh, biological material mutates or decays too fast. 
according to secular literature, under the very best of conditions, uh, DNA in something that's dead should be completely gone after about 10,000 years. You know, the DNA in our nuclei. So DNA uh, is sort of a not very strong molecule. And uh, it can fall apart easy. And the only reason it doesn't uh, do a lot of damage to us is that God designed in uh, repair mechanisms that continually repair our DNA. So mitochondrial Eve, some of you have met, uh, may remember her from uh, the date that they put uh, on the first woman, whom they uh, you know, sort of jokingly named Eve. Uh, but they could look back uh, from the mutations in the DNA in these little mitochondria in our cells. Uh, they're not the nuclei, but they're little energy capsules. Uh, we inherit them entirely from our mother, and they trace their her back, and they assumed a certain slow rate of theoretical rate of mutations, and they got the date of 20,000 years ago that she existed. However, when they started doing experiments on the actual rate of mutation, they had to shorten that rate. And in uh, the journal Science, uh, they actually said it could be as low as 6,000 years. <laughs> So uh, DNA uh, from insects in amber, you, you all remember the Jurassic Park series where they extracted blood that a mosquito had extracted from a dino and they used that to make a new dino. Uh, that's a little beyond uh, what can be done, but they can certainly look at the, uh, at the DNA in the insect himself. And, uh, you know, from objects that are hundreds of millions of years old, they can put together the, the DNA of those creatures. Yet it's, the DNA is supposed to completely fall apart after 10,000 years under the best of conditions, according to the secular journals. Something is a little wrong there. So we could say less than 10,000 years for that. That's just another sample. There's many, many of these uh, things being found. Uh, Permian bacteria. Permian is like uh, supposed to be uh, a geologic stratum, a layer that uh, was laid down 250 or so million years ago. And uh, they revived it from a salt dome. Uh, they found uh, bacterial spores in the salt dome. And uh, they revived them. And those uh, bacteria uh, have no damaged DNA. Yet the radiation they would have undergone during 250 million years should have just completely shredded the, uh, the, their DNA. But they have perfectly, they're perfectly workable bacteria. Uh, and so something was wrong there again. So we'll put less than 10,000 for them too. Uh, Neanderthals. By the way, Neanderthals are perfectly human, uh, just sort of a, um, a group of an ethnic group of uh, human beings uh, who existed after the flood uh, during the Ice Age. And uh, they're dated uh, by a method I'll talk about uh, as being uh, pretty old. Uh, but they recovered blood from a Neanderthal that they dated at 40,000 years. And they reconstructed the entire Neanderthal genome and confirm that he's just another uh, variety of human being. Uh, but, uh, but they didn't have any trouble reconstructing his DNA. And he's supposed to be that old. So something's wrong there, too. And there have been others uh, that were supposed to be older. Same thing. <coughs> so uh, some of you may have heard about this. Uh, it was over a decade ago. Uh, a T-Rex bone found in Montana. They uh, found in the marrow of the T-Rex big thigh bone uh, these things, dinosaur blood cells. They're still red, you notice. They're not brown. Uh, and uh, like blood cells you find in bone marrow, they have a little dark nucleus. You can see that in some of them. And they, the blood vessels that these were in were still preserved. And when they stripped away the, the stone, uh, the from around the bone, the minerals, let's say, from around the, the blood vessels, they were 
still stretchy and rubbery. And yet they're supposed to be 70 million years old for that particular dino. And this is not an uncommon occurrence. So we'll put less than 10,000 years for dinos. And uh, more dino blood cells and soft tissues in the journal Science. That is not a creationist journal. <laughs> it's a very prestigious evolutionist journal. Uh, 12th of June, 2005. And that's just one of the things being found. Now, this issue of the Creation Research Society Quarterly, it's a quarterly scientific journal, uh, has a whole issue devoted to uh, this stuff. Uh, it's called the iDino Project. Uh, uh, we uh, looked at a triceratops horn and uh, extracted uh, soft tissue from that horn. And, uh, and uh, you know, published in a secular microscopy journal. Uh, and uh, so the guy who did that was fired by his, his, uh, his university uh, for publishing something pointing to a young dino. <laughs> so, but uh, lots of things in that issue. Uh, among the other things is uh, carbon-14 dates on dinosaur bones. And I'll talk about that. But lots and lots of stuff about preserved tissue, preserved flesh in fossils. Now, things that old. If, if you had a, uh, an uncooked chicken leg bone, and you put it in your refrigerator, and you left it there for 70 million years, do you think any of the flesh of the chicken bone would be left? <laughs> so that's the problem that uh, the people who are doing, you know, like the lady who uh, was one of the contributors to the dino red blood cells, the T-Rex blood cells, she's been accused of being a clandestine creationist. She vehemently denies it, says she's a Christian, but she's a theistic evolutionist Christian and believes in the millions of years. So she and others have been working on ways they could preserve those things for uh, 70 million years. And thus far, they don't really have a good working theory. But this issue discovers, discusses her theory and some of the other theories and the evidence against it. So uh, where you get this issue, uh, the Creation Research Society Quarterly, uh, soft tissues in fossils, half-life, the half-life of that, those, that soft tissue is thousands of years. Half-life means diminished by a factor of two every few thousand years. And then there's carbon-14 in fossils, and I'll discuss that more. So uh, go to creationresearch.org, and you can buy this special issue there uh, by itself without subscribing to the rest of the journal. So pamphlet item number 12, not enough Stone Age graves. Now evolution uh, has a view of the human population that says uh, we're nearly 200,000 years old. Uh, you know, humans in their present form. Uh, you know, that's actually the only form we've been in, but nonetheless, uh, that's what they say. Uh, and they think that uh, there was a factor that limited the population to 1 million, maybe as much as 10 million, all over the whole Earth. And I'll discuss that factor in a moment. But I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and take the smaller number here, 1 million. So this is what would have happened to the population according to their theory. So here's time moving along nearly 200,000 years, and the population leveled off at 1 million pretty quickly and stayed level. That's their view. Now, uh, their view also is that sometime around 10,000 or so years ago, we discovered agriculture. And that's important because what they, the limiting factor is uh, their hunting and gathering assumed lifestyle. There's only so much acreage on the earth to gather and hunt in, and that limits how much food 
uh, is available and that limits the population, they calculate uh, to you know, a few million. And yet you have over nearly 200,000 years, a lot of people living and dying. So there's a lot of dead people that accumulated during uh, that period. And then uh, farming took uh, place for, uh, for some reason, they figure that early man wasn't smart enough to uh, figure out that you could put a seed in the ground and make plants grow, or uh, you don't have to hunt for the animals. You can just uh, you can uh, corral them up and eat them when you feel like it. So uh, so then anyhow they uh, they uh, they say that uh, that took the lid off the population so it could rapidly rise to the today's population. That's the evolutionary anthropologist point of view. So you ask how many people would have died during that period, and it's about 8 billion. You work out the numbers, it's not real hard. Uh, and they buried their dead. They didn't uh, let them just be scattered on the surface. They buried their dead with artifacts. Uh, so uh, even if the dead would completely decay away, there are artifacts, the stone axes, and the beads, and the necklaces, and such, uh, the pottery. Uh, in the graves with them uh, should still be there. So how many do they actually see? Only thousands. So instead of more graves of Stone Age people on the earth than there are people on the earth right now, uh, only thousands of, of such graves have been found. So that points to a much shorter length of time on the average over the whole earth uh, for the Stone Age. Uh, maybe about uh, 500 years in most places. In the Middle East, it was shorter, and in North America, it was longer. Uh, but uh, the Stone Age, the population was low. So uh, that's, that's why. And it fits with the biblical picture of a Stone Age and an Ice Age taking place uh, after the scattering of people from the Tower of Babel about 100 years after the flood. So now the next item is something that was very obvious. And it was even obvious to me as an unsaved teenager. It bothered me uh, in my high school years. And that is pamphlet item number 14, uh, that written history is too short. Written history. So uh, here I've got a uh, plot of the number of documents I up here is billions, down here is millions, here is thousands, and we get down to one on that scale, that kind of scale. And then here we have time, and here's Abraham, uh, Jesus Christ, and now. And you, you know the dates for those. But if you uh, start with billions of people today, there's also billions of written documents at least as many written documents as there are people. Uh, so, but if we extrapolate back in time to when the population was less, the number of documents uh, also decreases. So uh, we get down to somewhere around the time of Abraham, um, very few written documents, uh, and none, none before that. There's legends that claim to go back further than that, but actual documents such as uh, hier hieroglyphs on the, the walls of Egyptian temples, uh, actual writing that can be dated, uh, isn't too long ago. In fact, the time scale is roughly 5,000 years ago. You could, you could uh, argue, say, maybe a six or 7,000 years. Uh, that's OK. Uh, my point is that it's not hundreds of thousands of years. Mankind's supposed to have been around 100,000 years, or 200,000 years. So this is, uh, let's summarize this 90% type of evidence. Most of those dating methods say that the world is young. So in the pamphlet, we've got galaxies, supernovas, comets, sea salt, seafloor mud, uh, bent strata, I didn't talk about that one, the Earth's magnetic field, 
Helium and minerals, I didn't talk about that one. Radioactivity, um, uh, halos, I didn't talk about that. Uh, Stone Age graves, agriculture, many more. And I'm not going to try to read all of those to you, but uh, just take a quick, let your eye run down the list there. Fast hardening of rocks, fast decay of Saturn's rings, uh, fast coal formation, uh, magma to the Earth's crust, uh, lots and lots of things. Now, you're saying a lot of people want, when they see that list there, they say, where can I get a copy of that list? Well, you can get it on the internet. Uh, Creation.com has much more evidence of that sort. They have this article called 101 Evidences for a Young Age of the Earth. It's like a longer version of this with 101 evidences, several paragraphs per evidence and fully documented uh, in, from the scientific literature and the internet and so on. So uh, you go to creation.com and then uh, you just plug in 101 evidences into their search engine and this article will come up. So we're not talking about just a teeny tiny little bit of evidence. This is actually most of the evidence uh, on the age of the earth that exists. Okay, what about the 10% of other kinds of evidence that you have heard about, like carbon dating and all that? Glad you asked. Uh, this is pamphlet item number 11. Uh, evolutionists believe that fossils should have no carbon-14. Fossils are supposed to be old, and they think that carbon-14 decays fast. There shouldn't be any carbon-14 in fossils. Now, carbon-14 is the radioactive form of carbon. About one out of every trillion carbon atoms in your body, and all living things, uh, one out of every trillion is this radioactive carbon-14. And it decays uh, with a half-life of 5,700 years. That sounds like a long time to you, but that's actually pretty short for a lot of radioactive nuclei. Uh, they, it decays fairly fast, but it's a very mild kind of radioactivity and doesn't do much damage. But it's handy for dating things uh, because of that half-life. So 5,700 years, every 5,700 years, there's only half as much carbon-14 as there was before. Or if you go backwards in time, 5,700 years ago, there should be twice as much carbon-14. And, uh, you know, say 12,000 years ago, uh, four times as much. And you can work back in time. Uh, I'm sorry, there should be half as much about 6,000 years ago, and a quarter as much as, uh, uh, as today, 12,000 years ago. And if you work back in time, you can't go very far back before you reach a point where there's not a single carbon-14 atom left in the fossil. So no carbon-14 that would be detectable, certainly, after about a quarter of a million years. You with me on this? I mean, you know, people get People's eyes start glazing over when you say carbon-14 and half-life and radioactivity and all that. So, but if you can stay awake, you can impress all your friends with your newfound knowledge here. So, <laughs> so uh, and you'd be surprised. Even nuclear physicists I have known don't know how carbon-14 dating works. The carbon-14 comes from a process that generates it in the atmosphere and makes radioactive carbon in the atmosphere from cosmic rays. That gets into carbon dioxide. The plants breathe the carbon dioxide and make fruit. You eat the fruit, and so you get contaminated with carbon-14 as well as the plant. And then when you die, you stop taking in carbon-14, and the carbon-14 in you keeps on decaying. And so someone looking at your skeleton thousands of years from now uh, can make a pretty good estimate of how long you've been dead. That's how it works. That's not too complicated, is it? Uh, I, I don't think it is. is. Do you? Is this hard? Okay. Okay, well, here's a couple of fossils. 
And uh, this one's supposed to be six million years old, million. And this one's supposed to be um, 300 million years old. It's a trilobite. Uh, all the fossils below the Ice Age are supposed to be at least two million years old. And uh, the deepest fossils are supposed to be 560 million years. Okay. So you think they would find uh, carbon-14 in a fossil? Well, no carbon-14, really? And the answer is no. <laughs> there is carbon-14. And this has been a trade secret for a long time, since the 1980s, when they developed a much more accurate measurement, way to measure carbon-14. Uh, and they, uh, they started looking uh, uh, at things, and they looked at fossils for various reasons. And every fossil they measured has carbon-14 in it. And it's about the same amount in all fossils, the same percentage of today's ratio. Very, it's about a half a percent or a quarter of a percent of today's one out of a trillion. And all fossils contain, on the average, no matter where they are, what kind of fossils, where they are in the world, contain carbon-14. So from the carbon-14 dating journals themselves, you see they were putting this in their journals, but they just weren't advertising it. And uh, it wasn't until uh, not long ago the creationists started unearthing this data and publicizing it and doing our own measurements. Uh, so, but uh, they look at coal and wood and shells and uh, bone and uh, natural gas and carbon dioxide trapped in the ground and calcite, that's calcium carbonate crystals, uh, oil, and uh, almost all fossils have carbon in them. So uh, they all contain carbon-14. So there are various dates that you could attach to the fossils, various ages. Uh, the conventional age, just from geologic strata ages, the assumed age is millions to hundreds of millions. Okay. Now, if you use the standard carbon-14 dating assumption, you will get uh, an answer that's 50,000 years, give or take about 20,000 uh, for all the fossils. And, uh, but that, that assumption is probably not correct because of the Genesis Flood. The Genesis Flood buried a lot of plants and animals and buried them deep in the ground and took them away from the surface and took them out of circulation and they turned into coal and oil and natural gas. And there's about 100 times more of that carbon buried underground than there is on the Earth's surface and in the atmosphere and in the oceans today. Huge amount of so carbon that, that got taken out of circulation. And that had an effect on their key assumption, which is what percentage of carbon-14 to regular carbon uh, did the fossils start with? And if you mess with the denominator, the regular carbon, and take a lot of it out of circulation, uh, you're going to change their key assumption. So if you, you account for that factor, the Genesis flood, then uh, you get a, a corrected dates of about 5,000 years, give or take 2,000, let's say. Uh, so all the fossils have the same carbon-14 date, and it's thousands of years, not millions of years, from all over the world uh, at every layer and from every type fossil. So all those fossils are buried mostly in rocks that were laid down by water. And uh, so does that tell you, what that tells you is that you're, you've got a date for the Genesis flood. So, and the carbon-14 date of the Genesis flood is roughly 5,000 years. And that's just what the biblical age is. If you use the Hebrew text of the Bible, uh, it's a little uh, it's about 4,500 years ago. Uh, so, uh, you know, carbon-14 is not something anyone, any creationist has to apologize. Uh, carbon-14 is now our friend. Okay, now, of course, carbon-14 could, you know, people often think that carbon-14 
proves the Earth is billions of years ago. I heard, heard that on TV a while ago from uh, one evolutionist, and I almost fell off my chair laughing because it decays so fast. It can't prove billions of years, but it can prove thousands of years. So uh, how do they get the billions of years? They have other kinds of radioactivity dating methods using much slower decaying nuclei, the billion-year dating method. So what about them? Well, this is uh, one item uh, from that pan uh, that's in that pamphlet. Uh, this is uh, one that I've worked on personally, uh, pamphlet item number 10. Helium leakage from radioactive minerals deflates billions of years. We looked at borehole samples from a borehole in New Mexico near Los Alamos National Laboratory in the USA, uh, three miles deep. And they uh, extracted, for various reasons, uh, samples of this borehole of this granitic rock that was very deep within the earth. And uh, so they extracted it. And uh, we uh, got some of those samples. And we extracted microscopic zircon crystals. That's zircon is zirconium silicate. And uh, zirconium silicate is an interesting mineral because when it forms from molten rock and crystallizes, it grabs uranium, and it rejects one of the daughters of uranium. It rejects lead. It doesn't like to absorb lead, but it likes to absorb uh, uranium as it's forming. And these are tiny. This is about 60 germ diameters, 60 microns, uh, millionths of a meter. Uh, so they're tiny, but they're pretty little things. And, uh, if you've ever seen, uh, I think, in the scriptural name for zircon is Jason. Uh, so, and it's not quite the same as cubic zirconia. That's a different mineral, zirconium oxide. But, uh, but they're an interesting microscopic nuclear physics lab because they contain uranium when they start, but none of uranium's ultimate daughter of decay lead. So uranium decay not only makes lead, but it makes helium along the way. Because I don't know how many of you remember your grade school. How many of you had your grade school nuclear physics courses? Uh, no? no? OK. Uh, you've heard of three types of radioactivity, uh, alpha, beta, and gamma. So alphas are little helium nuclei. They consist of two protons and two neutrons. And uranium decays uh, eight times. It spits out an alpha particle, which is a helium nucleus. And the helium nucleus travels out. And in this size crystal, uh, a lot of them uh, stop before they leave the crystal. They grab two electrons and form a full-fledged helium atom. So here I'm just going to have one uranium-238 um, atom decaying down into uh, one lead 206 atom. And count how many helium atoms get made there. So w one uranium decaying to, to lead it makes how many helium atoms? Eight. That's right, eight helium atoms. And about half of those would be trapped in this size zircon 60 microns. So we know, if we know how much lead was in the crystal, uh, we know it didn't start with any. Uh, that's been proven experimentally that they don't absorb lead uh, when they start. So if we know how many atoms of lead are there, we know how many helium atoms were originally deposited in the crystal. OK. Now, helium can leave the zircon. Oh, by the way. The Los Alamos people dated these things just from the uranium and lead. They got an age of about one and a half billion years. Okay, At today's rate of decay, uranium-238, down through all these stages uh, to lead-206, it would have, would have taken about one and a half billion years to get the amount of lead that they see. Okay, That's how they get the billion year ages. That's one example. But uh, the helium, let's think about the helium. Helium 
and leave the zircon. Much helium, though, is still in the zircon. So here I've got a plot, just a chart, uh, the depth in miles going from half a mile down to two and a half miles. And it gets hotter and hotter as you go down there, starting uh, uh, at half a mile, it's about 95 degrees centigrade. And all the way down there, it's 277 degrees centigrade, uh, as hot as your oven uh, turned on full blast, I guess. It's really hot down there. And uh, I'm going to show you how much, what percentage of the original helium that was deposited we still found in the crystal. Up here, 80%, here, 58%, 42 uh, at uh, that, 27, 17, 1.2, finally down to 0.1. So the hotter the crystal gets, the less helium is kept. Uh, and that's perfectly consistent with a process called diffusion, where helium can leak through solid crystal structures. Uh, and the hotter the structure is, the faster the helium can leak out. So some helium leaked out. And how fast did the helium leak? Well, we want to see. We did an experiment. We commissioned an experiment with a well-known uh, expert uh, evolutionist. Uh, we didn't bother telling him we were a creationist uh, group. Uh, when they found out about that, when I told them, uh, they were very mad. But, uh, but we, they commissioned, they, they told us, uh, they measured the leak rates from the actual crystals that we used. And the bottom line is that helium leaks out so fast that the zircons have to be very young. So we, we, uh, we looked at how much was left, so we knew how much had been lost. We measured, we had a measurement for the losses, and then we had the laboratory has measured leak rates, and we divide that into the losses. Yeah, sort of, it's, the math is really more complicated than that, but that's the bottom line of it. Uh, you get about 6,000 years, plus or minus 2,000. The actual number was uh, 5,800 5, something years and uh, 1,999 on the error bars, but so I rounded those off. But uh, that's the date we got. So we basically invented a new way to date the same crystals uh, other than using the uranium to lead method. We used a helium leak method, and we got a much younger age than one and a half billion years. In other words, Helium leaks out of those crystals so fast that after one and a half billion years, there wouldn't have been any at all. So those crystals are young. So there's a technical book that documents this and other projects we have that are just as exciting, but the carbon-14 and, uh, and the helium uh, projects are part of this radioisotopes in the age of the Earth initiative. And this is volume two, and, uh, and this is a very technical book, okay? Uh, don't tackle it unless you, are, uh, unless you love techie stuff, okay? But it's online for free if you want uh, at icr.org. That stands for Institute for Creation Research, but just type in icr.org slash rate, R-A-T-E. And then you'll get a resource page, and the very bottom entry of the resource page is this volume two, which you can download as a PDF chapter by chapter. And there's one chapter on helium, there's another chapter on carbon-14, and there's lots of other stuff we found. The bottom line of our, our results is that it looks like God speeded up radioactive decay enormously during the year that Noah was aboard the ark. And, uh, and he did it, it looks like, to release heat within the Earth to accomplish the geologic processes he wanted to happen during the Genesis Flood. It may have been even the way he started the Flood. So uh, this, is a, this is a technical book. Now, uh, by the way, uh, all that uh, radioactive decay uh, would release heat, and that would help with the geologic processes, but it would release a lot of heat, and 
and some people consider that a major problem, but chapter two of that book uh, discusses that heat problem. And we're still working on a lot of different aspects of this work, this research. But there's a new layman's book, uh, actually it's been out for a while now, uh, and a DVD that explained the, the rate results, and you can find this on a lot of creation websites, thousands, dot, 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 not billions. And uh, the author is Don DeYoung. He's a really good science writer, very readable. Uh, so uh, at the other conference where I presented this, I said it was at the book tables, but it's not here. So you have to go online to get it. Now here's a, uh, uh, a non-technical book that has many details on a lot of things. It's called the Creation Answers book. Uh, uh, it has chapters on carbon-14 and dinos and starlight, how, that's what I'll talk about tomorrow night. And that's at creation.com. That's a, that's a great website. It has a lot of resources on it. Okay, the bottom line of all this is it's a young world after all. So here's the scale with the evidence. We've got a lot of young world evidence that I talked about, but we do have some evidence that's been on the old world side. Uh, we have carbon-14 and uh, some of those billion-year radioactive dating methods. So uh, the data for youth heavily outweighs the data that at first sight looks like it's old. And then the rate data explains those nuclear dating ages. So keep your eyes on, uh, on the right-hand side of the scale there. Carbon-14 shifted sides. And the other data we're working on taking right off the scale. So uh, we think we've got a really good case, scientifically speaking, for a young world. Why am I telling you this? I want you to trust the Bible. If you can trust the time scale of the Bible, that's the most questioned part. You can trust the Bible, and it becomes a direct connection between you and God. And you don't have to have some expert tell you that it means something other than what it really means. So that's, that's why I'm presenting this data to you. So remember that one verse, uh, Exodus 20, 11, For in six days uh, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Thank you very much for your attention, and I think it's going to be time for questions now. So. There are some websites for you if you want to write them down. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that presentation by Dr. Humphreys. And he has willingly volunteered to answer some questions that you may have. Um, I'm just going to give you the format for the questions. The microphones are in the aisle. We want you to use the microphone that is closest to you. And we will just take um, the questions as they come first, come first, serve. Now, we want you to just ask the question, please. We don't want you to go into any comments. Just if you have a question, come ask your question, give your name so that we can identify you, and then ask your question. So I'm going to start with the microphone closest to me. Gentlemen here. Hi, good night, Dr. Humphreys. Um, thank you for your um, educational um, insight. Um, for Christians, it is very obvious for us to see the truth, uh, to know the truth. You yourself said as a young man, you're an atheist. And I, I'm presuming that the further you dug into your um, physics, the more you realize that it is design and not um, chaos. Um, I'm just wondering, I mean, I know the, the answer is obvious, but I want to ask you, um, in the States, actually practically in the West, evolution is being taught as fact. Um, and what is happening is it's deceiving the young mind from very young. Actually, I think most of the schools in Barbados now are actually teaching evolution itself, even 
Catholic schools. So children come up being very confused. Um, we know that the, the enemy is the prince of the power of the air. So he controls media, TV, everything. Um, I would like to know what you think can change the course of history where most of us in here tonight are probably Christians. And there's not many, I, I, I might be wrong, but there might not be many people coming out here and challenging you from a scientific perspective without being a Christian. Um, where do you see the future and the course of what the Bible says about a young creation? And where do you see the scientific community embracing what you're teaching here tonight? Okay. Uh, well, it's kind of hard to answer, but uh, there's one course of action I would first like to recommend. And that is in our Christian schools uh, that uh, we teach creation science. Uh, I uh, went to a radio station and there was a Christian school right next to the studio and the kids were very enthusiastically studying whatever they're studying. And I asked uh, if they were studying any creation science and uh, my uh, escort said, no. They might get that later on when they're teenagers. Well, most kids have already made up their mind about these things by the time they get to teenagers. Uh, various studies have shown that. In fact, uh, most kids who are teenagers raised in Christian environments have decided by the time they are teenagers uh, that as soon as they get away from home, they're going to leave the church. So uh, telling them about creation science when they're in their teens is a bit late. And uh, there's no reason to wait that long. I would like to see Christian schools teaching, uh, teaching creation science, real science. The kind of stuff I, I taught here may be simplified. I've taught this same stuff to fourth, fifth, and sixth graders in public schools in the US. Uh, and they like it. In fact, they're among my smartest audiences. <laughs> I think there's something that happens to a teenage mind when uh, the hormones hit, and some people never recover. So, you know. uh, but anyhow, uh, so if you have any input with your creation, uh, with your Christian school uh, uh, teachers and uh, principals, tell them uh, that they should not avoid this subject. You see, they're avoiding the subject because a lot of Christians uh, don't believe the world is young. Uh, and some of them get very angry if you try to tell them that. And so the uh, Christian schools, just like a lot of Christian pastors, uh, generally avoid this subject. They don't like to take a stand on how old the earth is, according to the Bible. You know, you'd think they'd be the first to say, the Bible's very clear, it's, it's young. Uh, but they avoid the, the, the issue, and so do the Christian schools. So one thing I think would make a big impact is to teach creation science in grade school. And, and don't be afraid of giving lots of science. Kids just love science. I, I just happen to be one that never stopped loving it, so I'm still a kid at heart. But uh, anyhow, that's... What, uh, what's going to happen is anybody's guess in the scientific world. Uh, some of the biological evidence about DNA, uh, the, the complexity of the genome that the biologists are discovering, is that there's evidence that many of the former evolutionist biologists, especially the younger ones who can still change their minds, uh, uh, are secretly becoming at least what we call intelligent design theorists. They believe that there is some kind of intelligent designer behind all this complexity in life. But the evidence about the youth of the genome shows that life hasn't been around that long itself. And that's also starting to make a dent in uh, many biologists. So. But I don't know how far it's going to go. There, there's a natural bias, 
I remember having it uh, when I was an atheist um, toward uh, denying this kind of evidence, denying the Bible. Because, you know, when you're, when you're not a believer, uh, you'd much rather not have some God up there making the rules, telling you what to do. You know, you'd much rather do what you want to do. And, uh, and there, so there's a natural bias. So I don't know what's going to happen. Okay, next question. Get a little over here. Yes, good evening. Uh, Joseph Scott. Um, a very well presented um, discourse. However, we'd like to challenge you on your, this document um, here, the one yeah. that says that begins with Abraham at 5,000 years. There is a lot of recorded history pre Abraham. Pre 5,000 years. Pre 5,000 years. Well, you may remember I said, uh, and, and the dates for recorded history depend on carbon-14, and that depends on assumptions. No, I'm okay. talking about historical data. I'm not talking yeah, about well, carbon-14. Get... I cannot put on um, carbon-14 okay. with you. Let, right? let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I said when I presented that, you could, uh, you could say that it was 7,000 years, and, and I'll say now, you can say it was 10,000 years. Because I'm close at 10,000 years right now. No, if you're so, talking so, about... No, wait. If it's 10,000 years of recorded history, what happened to the other 190,000 years humans in our present form were alive on the planet, according to the other side? No, I, listen, I'm, I'm not dealing with mm -hmm. uh, that convoluted okay. element of, of um, saying this, get into all that. I'm just saying that we cannot start at Abraham. It does not start with Abraham. It starts before Abraham. Uh, That's all I'm saying. Hold a hold a uh, no, I did. I'm having trouble with Bajoran, <laughs> Bajor, Bajoran, no, Bajoran but, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm questioning here, I want to call into question here is that your history begins with Abraham. From what I'm seeing here, your history begins, the world's civilization begins with Abraham right here. Right? I'm saying that if you look at Egyptian history, Abraham came onto the world stage around 1675 BCE. Egypt is already in our 13th dynastic period, which is 4,100 4, years prior to Abraham. So what's the earliest Egyptian document dated at? Before that, if you go back to study one, um, the um, um, papyrus of Anai and stuff like that, you will get way past, a long time past. And you're not even, no, give me a number. A number. But at least it's 4,100 years prior to that. We know that it's 4,100 years prior to Abraham. I'm, I'm sorry, what's the oldest Egyptian document that can be dated? But those would and be what is the date on it? I cannot I'm, give I'm you. not trying to badger you. Yeah, I'm just okay. trying uh -huh. to get it clear. What do you think? I'm going to stick for four, that before the 100 year period because that's what um, the research that I've done so far. Right? So I'm talking before uh, one year. I'm before. sorry, your, your accent is, I'm missing about. 80% okay. of your words. Yeah. Okay. So could you say it slowly and just make it simple? Oh. What is your main point? The main and what, point. What is your question? The, you, the question is why do you begin at Abraham? What? Where did I? Blah, 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 blah. Why do what you, I heard. I'm sorry. <laughs> why do you begin at Abraham as your starting point? Why do I begin that at Abraham? Yeah, as your starting point. Uh, that's a very rough estimate of how many documents there were. You know, you could move it back beyond Abraham if you like. Mm. So you're getting hung up on a minor point. You can, you can move the document back to your earliest Egyptian pharaoh, okay? And maybe it would be claimed that that was 7,000 years. So, okay. Seven? Yeah, what's your worry? <laughs> or I leave it there. Okay. You. Are you worried that 7,000 years is not the 6,000 of the Bible? Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I guess the bottom line is that those dates are pretty uh, contested. And there's an, uh, an excellent set of articles at creation.com in their journal called uh, the Journal of Creation. And just in the last couple of years, there have been some really good 
uh, articles on Egyptian chronology. And uh, they point to some major errors that have been made uh, by secular scholars in putting together the Egyptian chronology. So uh, those dates that you, you see in history books attached to pharaohs uh, are highly questionable. And it's still a matter of great debate, not only among creationists, but among secular scholars, just how to correlate the Egyptian chronology with the biblical chronology. Okay, before uh, you, before I, you I begin, hope that kind of covered what you're talking about. So uh, next. Yeah, before you begin, though, let, let us just stick to the questions. If you have a question, ask your question. Make it as clear as possible, but ask only your question, please. Okay, <clears throat> my name is Karen Brown. Here is my only question. Uh, I recently read a book called Big Flood, Big Faith. And I don't know if you've heard of that book. No. Okay, uh, the author was uh, proposing um, that a meteor hit the earth. He was proposing that Noah's flood occurred uh, because of a massive cataclysmic event that obviously God would have brought about. And he gives her the models as to, you know, uh, not, not to get into that, but I just wanted to find, uh, ask you if you heard about it, uh, what you, if you think uh, a theory of the media hitting the earth, if you think is a plausible theory for Noah's flood and the impact it would have on, I, I see you mentioned something about the temperature of the earth and, and certain things like that. Yeah. I just wonder if you could elaborate on that a bit. Thanks. Well, the answer is uh, yes, I think it's a plausible theory. And there are a lot of uh, creationists I respect who uh, depend very much for their theories of what caused the flood uh, on meteor impacts. Okay. I like another theory, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Gentlemen here. Hello, excuse me. Uh, Hi, good night. Um, my name is Tevin Brown. Um, I already know the answer to this question, but just for the benefit of those who might not know, I would like if you could um, speak briefly on why it is I can't believe in both the Bible and evolution together, um, as in saying that God would have um, caused evolution to happen or used evolution as a means by which he brought man about. Oh, uh, let's see. There are these uh, Christian believers even who are evolutionists, and you're asking what would bring us together or something? No, no, I'm, ask, I'm asking um, you to speak on why it is you, you, well, is it, right, is it biblically possible that God could have used evolution um, to create the world or to bring about the modern world that we see today? Um, yeah. Uh, if you didn't have the Bible, you could maybe imagine that God used evolution. But uh, if you read the Bible, it doesn't sound at all, the process doesn't sound at all like evolution, you know. Let there be. Kaboom, there it is. <laughs> and the same thing for the Big Bang Theory. Uh, a lot of people don't notice this, but the order of events in the Big Bang, and that, that we're talking about physical evolution versus biological evolution. Uh, but uh, the order of events in the Big Bang is contrary to both, uh, is, is contrary to the order of events in the Bible. And also the events of the days of creation, if you w wanted to say each of those days was an evolutionary change, uh, that order is not right. For example, uh, uh, you have, uh, let's see, when the fish and the fish and sea creatures come along on the fifth day, and the birds come along on the same day. But the plants have come along long before this, and uh, they're land plants, whereas evolution says that all life should have started as plants in the sea, and then you get land plants, and then you get land animals, and, and or sea animals, and then you get land. Anyhow, the order of events in Genesis doesn't fit biological evolution or physical evolution, either one. So I would say that's my problem with, uh, with the theistic evolution idea. 
Um, good evening. My name is Thomas. Uh, my question here has to do, in fact, I have two questions. I have quite a few, but I'll just ask two. Um, the first one, given that we know, or we are starting from the point that the Earth is 6,000 years, is this a case where we try to make the data fit the conclusion? That's question one. And two, with regards to the cosmic, um, the larger cosmic phenomena, such as the formation of stars, present physical theories teach that it takes upwards of billions of years for the creation of stars. Uh, how do you reconcile that 6,000 years with the formation of, of the Earth? Oh, well, uh, the evolutionary theories assume entirely naturalistic processes for the formation of stars. So they, <clears throat> they uh, bring gases together and have them slowly get together by gravity, and then they have to lose some energy, and then they collapse some more, and, and uh, they spin around and have to lose some angular momentum. And, uh, and uh, there's a whole series of processes and several stages along those that way, those processes, uh, there's sort of a hand waving. Every every evolutionist acknowledges this. This they say you could have a protostar, but getting from a protostar to the next stage, we don't know how that happened, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's some iffy questions in that imagined naturalistic process, but uh, uh, we don't know that. Uh, the star is formed by that process. It may simply be that God said, I want a star. Here it is, kaboom. <laughs> that seems to be the way he made everything else in Genesis 1. So the answer is, uh, how do we know how long it actually took the actual stars to form? And that gets you away from evolutionary theories. And the only information that we have is happens to be in scripture. So uh, I'll talk more about uh, this problem in the Big Bang Theory on Saturday, uh, but there's a huge problem there uh, in assumptions. If you assume that everything was once nothing and then it gradually became something, that's still a, a huge miracle, okay? Uh, so, so it's not much of a, a step to say maybe there was nothing and then suddenly, kaboom, there was something. You see what I'm saying? So uh, it's, all, it's all just a... Uh, question two, what about question one? Question one had something to do with 6,000. Uh, um, question one was really, are you trying to make the observations fit the preconceived conclusions? Am I trying to date all are those? You, are you trying to make the evidence fit your conclusion, really? No. Uh, for example, that helium date that I got, uh, I was as surprised as anyone when it came out close to seven or 6,000 years. It was 5,700 and something years was the average for all the crystals that we had looked at. And the, the spread on it was... Uh, 1999 years, I remember that. Uh, so I, I was as surprised as any of that. I, I, you know, I, didn't, I didn't make that data. And it's in the rate book. The data is in that, uh, that chapter of the rate book. So uh, uh, same thing for the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, uh, it points to 6,000 years, but I'm, I'm I'm not trying to make it fit 6,000 years. Uh, it just, that's the way the data comes out. So, uh, yeah. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm thinking that the evolutionary theory or the science, modern science is kind of tenacious because it, it is used to extrapolate and predict scientific advances, uh, vaccines, um, you know, organ donation, things like that. 
So I'm wondering what creation science has done for us. Oh, what creation science has done in past history? What's it going to do and what has it done, yes. Uh, well, uh, you might consider... What can it predict? Okay. And what has it done? What it has done is founded uh, many of the branches of science that we have today. There's an interesting book by uh, Dr. Henry Morris uh, about uh, the founders of science. Could you be a specific, scientific, uh, what we have today that is because of creation science? Yes. Uh, Newtonian mechanics. Isaac Newton was a strong creationist. And uh, because he... No, I'm sorry, not the, excuse the me, misguided... Please. Excuse uh, me. Not what? You need not to let the, excuse me, ma'am. You need to let... You've asked the question. You need to wait for the answers. No, I, I just want to clarify because it might be my Bayesian accent. I'm, I don't want to... I don't care about what the person believed. I want to know the particular technology that creation science has given us today. Technology? Well, uh, how about James Clerk Maxwell, the greatest theoretical physicist of the 19th century? And he based his work on the greatest experimentalist of the early 19th century, Michael Faraday. Both of them were strong creationists. No, I, you're, you're misunderstanding me. Um, not the beliefs you, of you persons. I want a particular science or you're technology. You're not letting me answer the question. Both of those men, because of their creationist Christian beliefs, uh, developed their ideas. Uh, creation shaped their ideas. And it's because of them that we have this electronic stuff that sometimes behaves. OK, there's an example of technology. And uh, there's, there's a lot of examples like that. Uh, in other words, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but you look into most of those creation scientists and you will find uh, that they had an attitude toward the natural world. They were trying to uncover what God did. And because they were trying to uncover it... Uh, it sounds like we should stick with evolution. Why, why is she... So why are you telling her, letting her keep on dominating the mic? No, I, I, I think I've what, answered your question about two times, and uh, I think it's time for somebody else. Uh, pleasant good night to all. My name is Lyndon. Um, in your lecture, you mentioned the existence of dinosaurs, T-Rex and Tyrannosaurus Rex and so on. Um, what I wanted to ask you, though, is would I be able to find any reference at all in the Bible to dinosaurs? Well, not necessarily by that name, but in your estimation, is there any reference at all in the Bible to that kind of, of animal, that kind of creature? Oh, in the Bible for a dino? Uh, I'm sure a lot of you already know this, but go to Job chapters uh, 38 and 39. And, uh, and I think it's chapter 38. It describes a very large creature named Behemoth who lives in a swamp and apparently is the largest of all God's creatures. Uh, and he's a veggie eater. And uh, it describes him as uh, his bones are uh, like bronze and uh, like you know, they're strong, and it's a big thing, and he swings his tail like a cedar. Have you seen that? Uh, they used to think that brontosauruses couldn't fit that. Actually, brontosaurus is the old name. It's uh, an apatosaurus now. Uh, but they used to think that those creatures had such big tails that they had to drag them behind them but they didn't find any tail drag marks in the brontosaurus or apatosaurus tracks or any of the other large dinos. So they finally decided that the tail was stiff. And uh, so he bends his tail like a cedar. There's, there's some stiffness to it. And they didn't let it drag. 
And the, the whole description uh, fits an apatosaurus, really, or there's a really large version of one of those types uh, called Seismosaurus uh, by a nickname. He's really big. And uh, God said uh, those, it was the biggest of his creation. And then in the next chapter, there's a description of Leviathan. It was a seagoing dinosaur with scales, and his teeth are like doors, and around his teeth there is terror, uh, and he's, he's really big, and uh, no one can capture him. He's that dangerous. Uh, that's Leviathan. Uh, but he's a swimming, seagoing dinosaur, uh, and he fits a lot of these, uh, they're not officially called dinosaurs, but they're seagoing reptiles that everyone looking at them would say, that's a dino, uh, like a plesiosaurus. Uh, so Leviathan fits that description pretty good. So. Uh, good evening, Trevor Shepard. Hubble can see galaxies and stars um, millions of light years away. Yeah. Um, how then does that equate with a 6,000 year for, is the 6,000 year for the creation of mankind or the creation of the universe? That's my basic question. Okay. Are we talking when we say 6,000 years, is that relating to the existence of the human race, or is it relating to the existence of the universe? Good, good question. Um, scripture says that it's the whole universe that's 6,000 years old. Remember that Exodus verse? For in six days he made the whole universe. And then you can add up the years after uh, the creation of Adam, and it's, uh, today it's about 6,000 years. So then, how, how do you explain then Hubble being able to see... Why are they asking a second question? No, I'm not. This is still the first question. It's still the first question. Okay. How then do you explain Hubble being able to see objects that are supposed to be... Oh, millions well, of tomorrow's mi meeting. That's the subject of tomorrow's meeting. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay. I want to emphasize ask your major question and leave the follow-up questions for afterwards. I'll be happy to answer them afterwards, but we want to get everyone who has a first question first. Mr. Chairman, my name is Sylvan Lashley. I'm not going to ask a question. I just want to respond to a young lady who asked about the impact of creation science. I'm going very brief. When I was a young student studying zoology, chemistry, as a young Christian as well, I was confused. Because as you said, the zoologists and the people who were teaching me had no answers for me. And it was confusing. As a result of following the Institute for Creation Research, simple pamphlet studies from about in the 1970s gave me a reason to believe, consolidated me. If natural science itself would help me to predict, discover, vaccinations. I will still die physically. You will too. But what I found about the Institute for Creation Research and Creation Science is it gave me reason for faith, order. So when I study my atoms and my protons and my neutrons and I see order and I see the diversity in nature, it impacted my life. So for the last 45 years, I was teaching chemistry, still teach chemistry in Barbados, many doctors, engineers and so on. And they pass on with the same dynamism, a solidity, a faith. So I see it this way. Science and scripture make sense. And so instead of just having physical life, creation science helped me to observe and practice even eternal life. I pass that on to my students wherever they are in whatever condition. And a couple of years ago when I was probably given up for dead, Serious operation, major operation. Doctors, professors, all the students who I have taught passed through hospital and look at me. Last year going, I said, no. My solid faith in the God who controls the atoms and the neutrons and the protons. If science is going to do anything, it has to impact my life, your life, 
all the theories and hypotheses, we'll go to the earth. Thank you, sir. Good. Uh, you've stimulated me, and that's very good stuff. Uh, thank you. Uh, but you stimulated me to think of a case where evolution hindered science. And that was, uh, uh, you may remember a long time ago that people talked about junk DNA. That most of the genome was supposed to consist of junk that was acquired during these millions and billions of years worth of evolution. So the geneticists who were solid evolutionists didn't look at the junk to see if it had some function. But now, over many years, we have discovered that the so-called junk all has perfectly designed functions. And that was found out by creationists who thought that God wouldn't make junk. Okay. So that's sort of an example of creation and evolution at work in science, and uh, how actually believing having the wrong idea in your head about how things got here uh, affects what you look for. Okay. Okay, our final question is coming from over here. Hi, good evening. So you've explained what you've explained strictly from a Christian perspective, particularly as it relates to the God of the Bible. However, I do know that particularly as it relates to the Islam God, Allah, whatever it may be, that they also have conducted their own scientific versions, their own um, investigations, and have actually stated that the Holy Quran is the answer to everything and have actually put the numbers to it. What I want to know is, as far as the Bible is concerned, and as far as other religions and their scientific findings are concerned, what makes you think that yours actually holds the most virtue over any other type of religion who would actually come with their sense of truth and their sense of veracity. Okay, uh, let me just give the Quran as an example. I'm told, I haven't, uh, it's been a long time since I read the Quran, and I read it as an unsaved young man, uh, but I'm told that the early parts of the Quran say to treat unbelievers nicely, and the later parts say to treat them by killing them. Is that right? There is something to be said about, you know, death to the infidels, yeah. but there's parts of the Bible that say that too. That's right. So, the early part of the Quran says to be nice to them, the later part says to kill them. It's sort of a contradiction, don't you agree? Um, as wait, stated by the Bible as well, yes. So, I understand that uh, the Quranic scholars uh, have long ago decided to take whatever the most recent pronouncement by Mohammed was, and that will be the one they follow. And they seem to be acknowledging then that the early pronouncements conflict with the later pronouncements. Now, the Bible is not like that. The Bible is consistent from one end to the other. Because I spent a long time looking at the alleged errors. Uh, as a new believer, I wanted to know you know, so every time some skeptic came along uh, and said, oh, there's contradictions in the Bible, I said, well, okay, fine, give me one. Uh, and often they didn't know of any, <laughs> but some did come up with them. So I spent a long time, and I got books on the subject from skeptics and looked for the contradictions. Uh, there were no contradictions. I couldn't find any. So the Bible, I think, is unique among those books. I, at Duke University, before I was saved, uh, we were, had a required course on world religions. So that's when I read parts of the Quran and I read part of the Bhagavad Gita and, uh, you know, and uh, Buddha's writings and, uh, you know, all of that stuff. And even then, I formed the opinion that this other stuff in the other world religions, this was an unsaved, non-Christian, atheistic young man. I just was not impressed with that other stuff. It just seemed like a hodgepodge of contradictory ideas. So uh, the Bible is not like that. So that's one very good reason for sticking with the Bible as your basic picture of things. Okay. Is that the last? 
Thank you very much. And thank you all for asking the questions this evening. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I want to thank you for coming. Uh, we want to invite you back tomorrow when Dr. Humphreys presents his second lecture. If the Earth is young, 6,000 years old, then how can we see starlight from billions of light years away? So how can we see starlight, distant starlight in a young universe? That's, next, that's tomorrow night's lecture at 7. We want to thank our sponsors tonight who have made this all possible, Sun Power Hot Water Systems, Design Innovations, Rainbow Tours and Taxi Service, SDC Inc., Wolverine East Ice Limited, Mount of Praise Wesleyan Holiness Church, White Park Wesleyan Holiness Church, Shekinah Wesleyan Holiness Church, Todd's Church of the Nazarene, Bank Hall Church of the Nazarene, Kalama Rock Church of the Nazarene, and all those who support us significantly at a personal level. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Again, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow night at 7. Tell a friend. And Saturday night, we have a, a, a panel discussion between Dr. Humphreys and Mr. Ricardo Small, president of the Barbados Astronomical Society. Are there better cosmologies than the Big Bang? That will not be here. That will be at the Nazarene Church in Kalama Rock at 6.30. Um, the doors are open for you to come. It's all free. Look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you.